Hello and welcome. Uh, I'd just like to start by making some introductions. My name is Shaheen Chauhan. I'm based in our Dubai office and I head the global analytics business. Uh, and I'm delighted to be joined by Emeka Akpanonu, who is our director of North American analytics and takes the lead on IIR's forecasting and modeling capabilities. Um, in terms of agenda, Emeka and I will be presenting our spending forecast data for this year. The forecast data is based off the $6.4 trillion worth of currently active capital and maintenance projects that we're tracking and monitoring for Asia Pacific. Uh, and that is accessible to our subscribers uh, of our project tracking database. Now the forecast is then generated by statistically modeling these active projects and projecting spending trends out for the next five years. Uh, and what we've also done with that model very recently is we've also introduced a new factor or variable into the model to reflect the adjustments that we're seeing due to the current COVID-19 impact. But before we take a look at the analysis produced, I'd like to say a very big thank you to our sponsors. Uh, Uniper is a global energy company with over 11,000 employees around the world uh, that generates trades and markets energy to over 600 energy and industrial clients worldwide and their activities include the procurement, storage, transportation and supply of a host of energy commodities such as natural gas, LNG, coal and other energy related products. So uh, welcome team Uniper and thank you for your support today. Now, um, we are obviously seeing some quite unique sets of dynamics, all unfortunately exerting uh, substantial downward pressure across all industries and geographies. Now, how quickly and how long it takes us to get some degree of economic normalization and whether we come out of this via a V-shaped lift in the economy or indeed a long, slow L-shaped recovery is still very much an unknown. Uh, we are seeing some good news though. We are seeing some countries trying to break, break free uh, and certainly starting to relax restrictions on their lockdown to kickstart their economies and get folks back to work. But I do think that much rests on whether, uh, not only whether, but, but what the size of impact will be from any subsequent COVID waves that we may, uh, may actually uh, start to see, which I think, given that there's no vaccine in place yet, uh, is, is probably going to be something of a reality. Now, looking at the projective in, uh, that the impact on global growth this year, we came into the start of the year on a much more optimistic note. We'd seen a number of years of modest growth, nothing too dramatic, but it was growth nonetheless. We'd seen commodity markets were starting to show some rebalancing in supply and demand, although last year's escalating trade disputes did eat into some of that growth. But we did have a positive first step in addressing the US-China trade dispute with the phase one agreement. Uh, and so into the beginning of the year, there was an expectation that we would see some improvement in the levels of growth for this year. Although I did think, um, you know, this would be very sensitive uh, to any major market shocks and, uh, and unfortunately, lo and behold, what a shock we have uh, recently experienced this quarter. Now on the right there, you can see the new April IMF data, which now shows a very different outlook uh, and certainly an outlook which was, uh, you know, reflects the full impact of the current conditions that we're, we're, we're going through. But when we look at the sort of the broader Asia region uh, on the map, we can see that the IMF do expect to see some positive growth for this year in that part of the world, which is good news. Now, interestingly, also, if you look beyond this year and into next, uh, they are actually projecting a major rebound through next year with about 5.8% of economic growth, which again, I think, um, is still a little aspirational and I think will be very dependent on how effectively we come out of COVID-19, but also I think how we fix the current crude imbalance and get more supportive prices for those crude export driven economies. Now, I do want to just keep uh, uh, spend a few uh, minutes on the crude price situation. Obviously, the last you know, 48 hours or so have, have really seen some shock and awe in the market. And I think despite the, the recent OPEC plus agreement to cut production, the pace and the rate and the magnitude of these cuts is not really keeping in kilter with what is actually needed to address the demand destruction that we're seeing right now for uh, you know refined products, certainly for the, the first half of this year. Now, it is probably useful just to um, you know, focus in or hone in on uh, what's happening with US crude. We've seen the WTI three month futures price that fell into negative, negative territory, uh, a really unprecedented scenario, but one that is to some extent quite localized to US crudes. 
uh, you know, we have seen and are, you know, we were seeing continued big volumes of US crude production, although uh, this is now very much projected to be lower this year, uh, but is, is still certainly more volume than US refined, that the US refining system can actually accommodate. We've got to remember that many US refiners are calibrated to take heavy crude feedstock. So there is a limit really to how much domestic light sweet crudes coming out of the show plays that they can actually use. And so what we saw was the WTI prices for May delivery contract having slipped into what's known as a super contango, uh, which is where futures prices are trading higher than the spot price. And, and that was a result of a massive fall in refining demand, certainly gasoline in the US and the US market coming close to the tank top with limited storage available. And this um, you know, really has been further compounded with you know, relatively limited US Gulf Coast export capacity to be able to shift barrels to Asian refiners, uh, if indeed there is any additional demand opportunity in the export markets at the moment anyway. Uh, and so this, the long and short of it, there was just too much crude out there with really nowhere to go. Now, what we may see, therefore, is a combination of shock cuts, uh, although this will probably need to extend way beyond just OPEC and may probably require a, a coordinated effort amongst all global crude producers right now, really, to try, I think, um, uh, and ensure OPEC crudes and certainly the Brent benchmark that don't follow a similar path to WTI. There is obviously still very little short uh, storage capacity left around the world. And so producers and traders are having to you know, go to extreme measures. They're long lease, uh, long lease um, you know, uh, ships, uh, floating vessels, obviously to park what is now millions of barrels of unwanted crude, uh, simply because refined product demand has fallen so low. Now, uh, wrapping up that as, a, as, as what is a, a fairly bleak uh, outlook um, and bringing this down to what we're seeing in terms of the impact directly on the projects, there are two converging uh, impacts that are shaping our project spending forecast for this year. The first is the impact of projects that are already underway or have kicked off. Um, the projects that our researchers have spoken to so far are still uh, are communicating to those researchers that they, they are still very much looking to push ahead and complete their projects, projects best they can, but they are uh, already seeing much lower levels of productivity with it completion date slippages. So that is a real uh, major deviation from, from the kind of the spending curve that uh, we're going to be showing you to, today. Now, many projects are experiencing challenges due to lack of access to project sites or plants by contractors and uh, craft labor. And some of the bigger projects uh, are being impacted by equipment and material supply chains issues, especially those projects which have a big dependency on imported um, equipment or some of that infrastructure is actually being fabricated out of country. So that's creating those bottlenecks and delays. But again, even when we find projects that have slowed often to a halt, our researchers are still finding in all cases that project owners are still fairly confident that they're going to resume, but only once the lockdown is over, albeit many will start to show some throttling back in the pace and also the timing of spending. And certainly those schedules are going to be readjusted and possibly stretched out. Now for projects at the planning stage, uh, we're obviously seeing a slightly different set of impacts. Uh, we're seeing much heightened levels of cautiousness and scrutiny. We're seeing a number of large grassroots and big expansionary projects being pulled back, being reevaluated, scopes are being uh, redrawn, and certainly schedules are being revised and reworked under what is the new demand outlook. Now, again, we are seeing some cancellations, but nothing too alarming. There is no major wave of project fallouts from cancellations due, directly due to COVID-19, other than what we would just traditionally or typically see. But what we are seeing are that many projects um, are throttling back their funding decisions and with it, the schedules. Uh, and these are being pushed out. And under current projections, this is expected to increase even further as we move through Q2, uh, but this will obviously vary depending on different in industries and different geographies and by obviously the longevity of the COVID-19 lockdowns. But uh, what we are seeing, I guess a, a small upside, is uh, we're actually seeing much stronger support for the smaller 
in plant capital projects, essentially those projects that could yield uh, process or margin improvements. And in fact, uh, just taking sort of the aggregate view, um, you know, some sectors such as chemicals, for example, are seeing um, our researchers are actually finding more new smaller implant capital projects. So we're seeing a lot of that big capex spend being pushed into those smaller ones. Now on the maintenance side, just to complete the picture, we've started to see a shift in the shape of turnaround spending. We're seeing uh, turnarounds being pushed out, uh, certainly in uh, sectors like refining and to some extent chemicals, but really it, it, it is still very much a mixed bag. Uh, and by that, I mean, it, it really depends on the protocols and the measures that plant operators have put in place around having external contractors on site. Uh, and then there's obviously the challenges uh, due to the lack of availability availability of these contractors in the first place uh, as many of these workers are still staying at home. Now um, that is the backdrop maybe I could hand over to you Mecca just to talk folks through uh, the new uh, forecast model and, and some of the new factoring that you've done for that model. Thank you Shaheen. Um, so I'll be talking briefly about some of the key modeling considerations um, we've had a webinar on this topic a few weeks ago, um, and as I said then, uh, the, the model will keep on being adjusted as we learn new facts about you know, how the virus is affecting the, our various um, industrial markets. So we've had some adjustments since last time, and I do anticipate we'll, we would have even you know, new adjustments in upcoming webinars. So I, I will speak briefly about what to anticipate um, uh, in future and what has already changed so far. But for the um, sake of people who weren't in on the last webinar, I'll briefly go over the um, how the um, methodology works again. Okay, so I know it's a bit of a busy slide here, but we'll tackle it in sections. So let's begin with the table on the top left. Um, in order to estimate the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on industrial activity, um, on a daily basis, our researchers are communicating with key project contacts to get an understanding of the impact of COVID-19 on schedules and scopes of you know, various projects. So for those projects which our researchers are yet to contact or get a response on, we've gone ahead and developed what we call our COVID-19 impact model to estimate the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on you know, um, project activity. And some of the key variables are highlighted on the table in your top left. First variable there on the list uh, refers to the time it will take for the virus to be contained. Essentially, this is linked to the duration of the lockdown um, or, and or partial lockdown in some cases due to COVID-19. We currently run scenarios for three, five and seven months. One adjustment we've done you know, compared to last, the last webinar is that we're going to be focusing on the three month scenario when we do a deeper dive into the various industries and in the upcoming slides. Part of the rationale for this is, you know, there's a lot of commentary um, out there in the news about the expectation for the lockdown to begin getting lifted um, partially, perhaps in many cases, as early as May. Right now, we will be monitoring this to see how successful it will, it will be. But for now, we're, we're basing most of the um, following upcoming slides where we speak more about the industries on the three month scenario. Then on to the second variable there on the table, that's the level of disruption of project activity due to COVID-19. Assumptions were given for a low of about 25 to 35% disruption, a um, minimum of 52 to 68% disruption and a high of 80 to 99% disruption. The level of disruption in our model varies by industry, and we'll be speaking more about this when we walk you through each of the individual industries. Now, projects that were already in construction prior to the commencement of COVID um, the commencement of the COVID-19 lockdown uh, are assumed to continue with reduced throughput or productivity subject to this disruption levels. On the other hand, large projects which were yet to kick off um, construction prior to the lockdown measures are assumed to delay construction altogether till the, you know, till after the, the lockdowns are relaxed. So that's the logic we, you know, we we applied for the projects which we haven't gotten a direct information from our researchers on about you know, the, um, the actions being taken as a result of COVID-19. Now, the third variable on the table is the post-COVID-19 recovery period. And this variable refers to the number of months we um, anticipate that it will take for 
project activity, financing and budget, um, consumer confidence, demand, and so on, um, to return back to normal, you know, after COVID-19 lockdown. Our current model assumption stands at a low of about three months to a high of eight months. Now, again, this is another variable that we'll be monitoring closely. Um, you know, we've we've had all sorts of estimates, I believe, um, you know, some people anticipating that, that it might take even upwards of 12 months for things to sort of, you know, get back to normal and for consumers to regain their confidence and so on. But um, so far in this current model, as of now, we are using a low of three months up to a high of eight months. And we'll keep monitoring this and updating accordingly. All right, let me move your attention to the bottom left of the screen. And this is a visual to illustrate the, ver the variables I described earlier on, you know, when I was describing the table above that. So we have applied this model to over 170,000 projects, right? And what you can see using that, um, the chart here as an illustration is that the time from virus start to virus end, that, that refers to the time to virus containment. Um, and then you can see what uh, I was also trying to refer to as the peak disruption point, and that's the lowest part in the chart, the, the dashed red line. And then um, the post-COVID economic recovery begins at virus end and continues till we can see things get fairly back to normal, right? Now, um, there's been a lot of questions we've, we've received, and it's something we're anticipating about the chances of a second wave, right? In the, in the scenario of a second wave, which you know, we're beginning to hear little snippets of, and we're still monitoring that. So it's not yet factored in this model. However, um, in upcoming um, updates, if we, we see more evidence of that, then you could be expecting a sort of you know, double dashed red line beneath that, right? And the, the mode of the recovery is also one of great debate of, are we gonna expect a U-shaped recovery or you know, sort of an L-shaped Nike swoosh, right? So if there's a second wave, then you'd be anticipating a double Nike swoosh, right? Double dashed red line. And you know, some research also says that if there is actually a second wave, um, you know, based on historical evidence, for example, the um, 1918 Spanish flu, in in regions where you had the second wave, that actually turned out to be to um, result in a more intense lockdown than you know than the first lockdown. So, you know, for the for the good of the industry, we do wish that you know um, it doesn't come to that. But we'll be monitoring it, it, it closely. And then briefly taking your attention to the right hand side of the slide, we've applied this model to over 170,000 projects which we're actively tracking and monitoring. Um, and furthermore, you know, like I said earlier on, our researchers conduct daily phone verifications um, to the various projects to understand the impact of, of COVID-19 on this on this um projects. So we maintain this stop projects and we provide that information to our subscribers. Okay. Now I'm um, shifting gears to the next slide. And uh, here I'd like to highlight some of the main outputs of our analysis. Okay. Um, I always like to point out that these results are, you know, as of now, right? Keep on updating and keep on keep on changing every time we we get more information and update our models. Um, so, some of the key messages here, I like to pull your attention to the top left, the the blue boxes on the top left. We saw an estimated APAC industrial spend of about um, 1.085 trillion in 2019. Uh, prior to COVID-19, we were forecasting that number to grow to about 1.15 trillion in 2020, right? For now, I'll skip the boxes on the red, um, red uh, hand side, no, on the bottom left hand side, the red boxes, I'll skip that for now um, because we'll do a deeper dive later on in the upcoming slides. Let me briefly speak about the chart on the right hand side. So as you might recall, from the previous slide, the disruption level and the time it will take for the virus to be significantly contained are key inputs in the model, right? So putting this all together, you get nine boxes representing nine different scenarios, right? You have the top three columns, low disruption scenario, medium and high disruption scenarios. And on the right hand side, you have the three months, five months and seven months scenarios. So combining that together, you get a combination of, of nine scenarios. 
Um, for the following slide that will come up later on, we'll be focusing on the three month scenarios as we speak about the individual industries. And like I said earlier on, um, we are picking those three months at the moment based on you know, what we're hearing in the news, um, mostly coming, of course, from politicians. Um, you know, we all know the health, the health experts are anticipating that the lockdown might stretch well into the summer. But most of, you know, well, we can only rely on what we were hearing so far. We keep monitoring the situation as um, a couple of economies around the world are looking to open back up in May or as early as May, a partial um, release of the lockdown. Countries like um, Germany, um, some states in the US, India, China, and so on are talking about starting to ease the lockdown measures as, as early as May. So, well, we'll see how this goes and update our models accordingly. All right, so on to the next slide. I'll be presenting the same general message here again, but from the standpoint of project types. And I'll, I'll explain why this is actually very, very relevant. Um, adding some more to what my colleague Shaheen spoke about earlier on. So we've gone ahead now and we've grouped spending on capital projects into three categories, namely grassroots or brownfields, and these are your typical larger new builds, and they usually make up the, the bulk of the spending um, over, over year over year. Uh, in the second um, box there, we have the additions and expansion projects. And these are additions and expansions to existing facilities. And globally, this represents the second largest bucket of spend um, globally, as well as in the APAC region. region. Um, so this consists of projects such as plant and unit expansions, um, equipment additions, and so on. And finally, um, the other capital projects, and this include plant closures, efficiency programs, environmental compliance projects, and so on. So your typical smaller in-plant um, capital, which, like my colleague said earlier on, we are seeing those being the ones which are able to um, progress more during this COVID-19 um, lockdown. Um, so the, the thicker lines in the charts refer to the base case, and basically that refers to the forecasted spend on industrial um, activity prior to COVID-19, and then the dashed lines represent the various post-COVID-19 scenarios that we highlighted in the previous slide. Um, a key point here is that we would expect, you know, the, the larger projects which comprise the grassroots and some portions of the additions and expansions um, to be the hardest hit, you know, during this pandemic as um, companies decide to put these projects on hold till things clear up. We've actually seen also um, some instances where project owners have opted to outrightly cancel some of these projects uh, or go through a sort of downward modification of the scope and um, budget. But like my colleague Shaheen said, most of what we're seeing are just you know, delays to, um, to kicking off the projects being pushed out to, to the right you know, um, post COVID waiting for some more certainty and for some more coming of all the market volatility going on right now. Um, and then we're also seeing in cases where perhaps the project was already undergoing construction to a uh, you know, um, large degree prior to COVID, um, the, the, the activity would continue, but perhaps at a reduced pace, you know, reduced throughput and so on. So for this larger project though, we would expect to have them go closer along the lines of the mid to worst case scenarios, while on the other hand, um, the other capital group and some of the additions or expansions, you know, your, your, your lower budget ones, um, as well as maintenance projects, which aren't shown in this chart, uh, will take a softer hit after the COVID-19 pandemic comes under control. A quick note I'd also like to make here before we move on to the next slide is that the ratios between these categories you know, do vary across the world from region to region and across industrial sectors. And we'll see some of that um, as we proceed to the following slides, like for example, in the chemical processing industry in APAC and the metals and minerals industry, you must have your grassroots and, and addition projects neck at neck, you know, equal ratios. So um, on to the next slide, Shane. Okay. So um, I'll like to introduce this table to you because you'll see a couple of tables that follow the same format as we go along the upcoming slide. So let me um, you know, quickly describe the layout to you. So walking from left to right on this slide, 
we, we begin with the leftmost column, letting you know the you know the regions that each of the rows represent. So that's the APAC region, which is comprised of East Asia, where you have China. Um, that accounts for the bulk of the spending, as you can see, upwards of 80%. Um, Oceania, South, East, uh, South Asia, and then um, second highest spending is the Southeast Asia region, right? So that's your market regions on the left-hand side. The second column represents what we forecasted or estimated to be the spending back in 2019, um, industrial spending, all industries, 2019. So APAC stood at about 1.085 trillion, as I had shown you in earlier slides. And then the, the third, third um, column there represents what we had initially forecasted um, to be the spending in 2020 prior to COVID, 1.152 trillion for, um, for the APAC region. Then the three colored columns where you have um, low impact, medium impact, and high impact, that represents what we are anticipating for the various um, scenarios of low or medium or high um, as a result of COVID. And remember, again, we are specifically picking the three-month scenario where we are anticipating that the lockdown will begin to ease um, you know, to a large degree by the end of May, um, and that's subject to change. Right. Then um, the after you focus on the slides that represent, I mean, on the columns that mention the, the um, types of impact, low, medium, and high, that's followed by what we had initially anticipated as the year-on-year -year change from 2019 to 2020, 6.1% for APAC. That was a previous um, estimate of you know, growth in the industry's industrial spending. Um, and then you are followed by a column which represents the, the new adjusted forecast due to you know, post-COVID for, for the, um, for the uh, region. So APAC initially had a forecasted spend of 1.152 trillion and that's been adjusted down to 897 billion right now, subject to change as well as we get more information. And then jumping over to the rightmost two columns, um, you have what the selected impact for that um, region, right? So the 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 um the selected impact would vary by industry and by region. In this case, where you can see it coincides with the highlighted impact um, column of medium impact percentage, a negative 22.1 percent. And then your rightmost column represents what we are expecting the year-on-year -year change to be um, from 2019 to 2020 as a result of the COVID pandemic. All right. So um, the next couple of slides will flow that same format. Okay. Now, doing a bit of a dive into industries, um, and then you know, Shine will then go on later on to give you some of the rationale between why we have um, we are anticipating the various types of impacts that we are. Um, you know, that we've allocated to each, um, each industry. But let me quickly speak about some of the key highlights um, here. So I do know it's another very busy slide, but I'll speak quite briefly about some of the key highlights. And, you know, like I said earlier on, Shaheen will be going into more detail in the upcoming slides. All right. So let me quickly pull your attention though, before we begin to the right hand side of the slide titled Market Impact. Right. So what we've done here is you know, we've got some icons to indicate our expectations with respect to the impact of COVID-19 um, and fallen oil prices. Right. Now, let's walk down the list of the industries, focusing on some of the larger ones. I, I wouldn't you know, bore you through each single element of this table. So beginning with power. Um, you know, the largest largest industry um, industry in the sector, uh, accounting for upwards of 30% of industrial spend um, historically and into the future. Um, and when we say power here, we're referring to conventional and renewable energy generation, transmission and distribution, um, microgrids, battery storage, and so on. Um, now, IIR is tracking over 50,000 projects globally in this industry, and over. 50% of that forecasted spend in the APAC region um, are grassroots and new build projects in response to you know, the growing energy demand in the APAC region. Um, prior to COVID-19, we were anticipating a growth of about 5% in industrial spending for the power industry across the APAC region. Now, as a result of COVID-19, we're expecting a decline of about 13%. 
We do anticipate a strong rebound post COVID-19, you know, due to continued underlying demand and um, prioritization of this sector by governments and region. So we are currently rating this to experience that low impact scenario. And you know, later on, Shane will speak more to you know, our rationale behind that. Moving on to the um, second largest industry here is the industrial manufacturing industry. Um, this is a bit of a catch-all for us because it represents basically any industrial activity or almost any industrial activity that does not quite fall into the other sectors listed. So in general, um, durable and non-durable goods manufacturing, right? East Asia is the biggest region here as well, you know, from driven by China. Um, IR is tracking over uh, almost, almost 20,000 projects globally in this industry. Um, we saw a very strong year of grassroots spending in 2019. Um, some of that was expected to soften in 2020. Um, so prior to COVID-19 pandemic, we were expecting a decline of about 9% in the industrial spending for um, industrial manufacturing year on year in the APAC region. And now as a result of the COVID pandemic, that decline has moved from negative nine to negative 28%, right? We'll continue to watch this um, industry quite closely, um, but for now we anticipate this will experience that high impact scenario. And we'll go into details of you know, the rationale behind that later on. Now, I'll briefly speak about some of the other larger industries in the region, um, including metals and minerals, um, where we're tracking mines, mills, processing facilities, and the um, chemical processing industry, where we're tracking petrochemicals, um, specialty chemicals, plastics, and so on. So these are quite um, unique industries for many reasons, um, one of which is that they have an almost equal ratio of grassroots and new builds versus additions and expansions to existing facilities. Now, prior to COVID, we were expecting some of the strongest growth in 2020 for these sectors, you know, um, namely chemical processing and metals and minerals at about 16 to 18% year-on-year growth, you know, 2019 to 2020 year-on-year -year growth of 16 to 18 percent. Um, now, post COVID 19, um, we are expecting the sectors to experience the medium to high impact scenarios, leading to a year on year decline in spending of about 14 to 15 percent. Okay. Um, and Shaheen will go on in the um, following slides to speak behind some of the rationale behind the, um, you know, the various impact allocations that we've given to each of these industries. Okay, so yeah, over to you, Shane. Thanks, Emeka. Uh, before I get into those industries, I would just like to remind folks that, uh, you know, the, 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 the work that our researchers are doing, they're, they're, they're currently working through and have been for a good two months now, working through the 171,000 or so active projects that we've got around the world. Uh, it's a big task. Uh, but it's one that we do, uh, what they're doing is, is identifying uh, those individual projects which have been impacted and flagging those, uh, as well as those which we've revisited and, and spoken to and found that they're seeing no impact. So what you can see is if you go onto our website and you've got access, you can see a daily listing of these on our website and, then, and that links through then to the underlying database. Uh, and, and that access is obviously limited to, you know, what you're subscribed to specific to your coverage and access. So please do make use of those, uh, of that site and, and, and do, a, do a daily check on which projects we visited and are, are showing some impact and, and those which are still proceeding as normal. Okay. Now, uh, into some of those industries. Um, Looking at some of the broader trends and drivers specific to, and I'm just going to focus about talking about the, the, the trends associated with the crude markets. Obviously, uh, much of the broader crude market developments that we're seeing across the world uh, are obviously uh, impacting APAC regional crude markets too. We have seen global IOCs uh, initiate and announce uh, 2020 CapEx cuts. Um, some are announcing anything up to sort of 30 to 35 percent cuts for this year. But what we are seeing is that regional LOC, NOCs are, are, are really trying to uh, look and try and get that balance between keeping production online to help support and stabilize their economies, obviously keep those tax revenues coming in, whilst having to accept, unfortunately, much lower margins. Now, there is still uh, a, a need long term for capex to flow into expansions and extensions. Um, certainly, you know, in markets like Southeast Asia, for example, where we're seeing 
uh, a number of those offshore fields, uh, they're aging and showing falling production rates, but we do expect to see a fall in the level of upstream exploration investment this year, uh, and certainly with it drilling activity and a reduction in rig counts already being initiated as well. And like elsewhere, many projects will see their budgets and FID decisions delayed and, and certainly pushed out. And I think probably well into the end of this year, if not into 2021. And obviously projects still at the planning stage, um, you know, most likely uh, they will be brought back to the table. They're going to be re-evaluated uh, probably with more focus uh, being put on any capex savings that can be made is going to be moving into those smaller implant capital projects. Certainly those projects that we think will yield production cost benefits and obviously supporting uh, balance sheets and, and really to help keep existing production operating at those optimum levels required. Now, moving quickly into the gas markets, there is a big long-term demand outlook for gas um, across the region, uh, and that's supporting still a lot of active gas production projects. We've currently got uh, about $119 billion worth of total oil and gas active projects across Asia Pacific, uh, and about $103 billion of this is associated with gas production. Uh, and there's also another further, uh, I think it's 16 billion, which is associated with the uh, gas processing and treatment infrastructure and CapEx investment as well. Now, on the LNG side, Oceania and Southeast Asia are the two big markets, both with about 50 billion currently active, uh, and East Asia almost has, uh, I think it's just about $7 billion now. Uh, that's the, 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 the broader look of what's currently total active spend. Now, um, spending planned to kick off this year in 2020 is sitting at around uh, $8.3 billion of gas production across Asia, Asia Pacific, with Southeast Asia sitting with about $3.8 billion of this. And, and almost all of this is associated with grass, grassroots wellhead platforms and, and drilling programs. Now, the next big market is China, about $3.4 billion of LNG liquefaction spending planned to kick off this year. And a lot of these are actually associated with uh, those smaller micro LNG grassroots uh, projects and certainly some additional uh, unit add-ons as well. Now, uh, the, the, again, the, the, the same impacts will be felt on many of those projects that are still at the planning stage. And we are seeing that there is increasing scrutiny on the timing of those investment decisions, especially I think uh, in light of the fact that gas markets and LNG markets in particular are very well supplied right now. Uh, and there's even more LNG production capacity expected to come online from the US uh, this year. That will certainly add additional volume and cargoes to the market. So this gas oversupply has really resulted in suppressing LNG spot prices. Uh, it's really pushed the market away from producers and towards a buyer's market currently. Uh, fundamentally, though, um, from a macro perspective, the medium to long term uh, growth for LNG remains very strong. Um, we still expect, uh, you know, LNG growth out well into 2030, and this will obviously require a lot more additional LNG uh, liquefaction and production capacity on top of what we've already uh, seen operational in the market, but we are expecting uh, something of, a, of an, over, uh, an imbalance. We're expecting an oversupply in 2021 and 2022, and that could push into 2023 now. Uh, and with this in mind, we don't really expect any major LNG cancellations for projects right now. Certainly, those projects where funding is already in place, they should be fine, albeit uh, there will be some project re uh, you know, schedule adjustments, uh, and we do expect in light of weaker prices uh, that a lot more supply coming online and a number of LNG buyers foregoing their existing supply contracts to now opt out and take cargoes off the spot market. This may actually um, result in a lot of developers now deferring some of their budget decisions with less projects possibly getting sanctioned this year until obviously there is um you know more clarity around what the true demand outlook looks like for this year and certainly into uh into next now the the, the sort of the flip side of that coin on the buy you know the the, the buy side uh, and in particular on the lng regasification and storage side of the supply chain we may see more 
um, resilience. And that's kind of why we've put the COVID impact at low. Um, you know, gas is uh, still cheap, it's plentiful. Uh, and so that is an incentive for those who are buying uh, inbound infrastructure capacity to possibly move forward and continue with their plans. We see that China and Southeast Asia are the two big LNG regasification markets at the moment with a total of 72 billion and 21 billion of currently active, uh, of the currently active $301 billion or so of LNG regas active that's active at the moment and at various stages of development. And just to caveat that, that includes uh, projects which are already under construction. Now, what's planned for this year? Well, uh, there's still about $23 billion of plan, uh, you know, uh, investment still planned to kick off uh, in China and 6 billion or so, uh, and 4.1 billion in Southeast Asia and, and South Asia respectively. Now, as I, as I sort of said earlier, the prospect of continued low prices off those well-supplied LNG markets may actually be creating um, you know, a, a good window of opportunity for those with regas and storage projects to possibly lock into this window uh, and push forward with their projects. Now, on the sort of the crude storage, the crude terminal side of things, there's about $30 billion or so of active spending that's at various stages of development, including, you know, projects already under construction. China accounts for pretty much the bulk of this, over 80% of this uh, active investment. Uh, and as we know, um, you know, liquid storage capacity right now is at an absolute premium, uh, and this could obviously extend well into next year if we don't see demand growth improve. Uh, so we may see some of, uh, you know, this sort of support that we're uh, seeing at the moment for the storage side. Um, you know, certainly with some of those currently planned projects, we may see that be uh, quite a supportive piece of momentum to keep those projects moving forward. Now, briefly, just looking and, and showing you some of the numbers associated with pipeline spending. Obviously, how pipeline spending develops is, is obviously going to be very closely linked to how the upstream spending plays out. If we look at the total planned pipeline of spending around the world, Asia Pacific right now is actually one of the major markets uh, with you know tens of thousands of miles of pipelines expect, expected to be finished to finish construction and coming to service over the next you know 24 36 months so along with spending in the terminal sector this could also uh, be presenting a fairly healthy midstream spending outlook although we think there is a little bit of jeopardy because of the dependency some of these pipeline projects may have on the upstream and so we've rated it uh, with a with a with a high uh, impact at the moment. We think there's, uh, there's there's some possible jeopardy there. Now, just looking at the composition of that pipeline spending, uh, the vast majority of it is associated with gas-related infrastructure, obviously to support the delivery of new takeaway capacity from both production and processing sites, and obviously enable that uh, feed to uh, reach its way into areas of high demand, such as power generation. Now, moving into refining, um, overall, it's really China and India that are, uh, that are the, sort of the, the major refining markets in Asia Pacific. Uh, Southeast Asia has a relatively small refining fo footprint from a plant perspective. It's got about 10% of the plant count across Asia. But, um, you know, I think we're all fairly familiar with what's happening in the refined markets at the moment, uh, but, you know, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that longer term, the demand outlook for refining still remains intact, really. Um, you know, and it's intact because of that rapid population growth and more importantly, the growth in the Asian middle income, which will obviously translate into more people driving vehicles. Uh, and the fact also that most countries are building their own domestic capacity uh, really to meet this demand growth and certainly try and offset some of their uh, need for imports. But um, we can't ignore the fact that refining markets across the board have obviously seen substantial short-term demand destruction after almost two months of almost total uh, you know, shutdown in passenger mobility. And this has obviously put considerable strain on operational refining capacity, although there has been some support from lower crude input costs, which have helped sort of, you know, prop up margins to some degree. But uh, the reality of it is, 
uh, you know, the refined markets uh, is very well stocked and supplied certainly with gasoline and jet fuel right now. And this may obviously put some of the planned expansionary capacity type spending in a lot of jeopardy right now. We don't expect, uh, again, uh, you know, a huge wave of outright cancellations. But what we do expect and we are seeing is certainly some deferring in project decisions, certainly over the short term. And what we mean by that short term, that could well extend into the middle part of the year. Uh, now, that may come back and get initiated again once we see countries come out of lockdown. Therefore, any spending that we do see moving forward and the, where we see the priority is certainly on those uh, smaller implant capital projects, the, uh, you know, that spending that's going into process optimization, or op optimization type projects, um, spending into revamping units to add more crude slate optionality, uh, and certainly spending on, you know, tweaking unit production slate, certainly to try and produce most in demand products such as diesel, um, which is which is held up reasonably well compared to the other uh, refined product types. Um, and like other refining markets across the world, we are expecting to see a number of turnarounds and maintenance projects being pushed out, other than those which are obviously seen as essential, but obviously even those which uh, plant operators do want to move forward with, they are being delayed. There are challenges uh, in fulfilling these projects simply of just restricted or limited labor access to those plants to do you know, to get on site and do the work. Now chemical processing, um, you know across APAC, you know the, the contribution this sector makes uh, towards helping support regional manufacturing sectors is is really a, a key enabler to supporting you know longer term economic growth and much of that is again looking to build capacity. Uh, both in the petrochemical sector and the downstream uh, plastics and rubbers, uh, really to try and capture the long-term demand outlook for consumer products from that growing Asian middle income. Now, whilst there has been some cost advantage passed back to Asian producers, those NAPSA crackers of lower uh, crude prices, there has obviously been a lot of short-term demand destruction for chemicals. It is a mixed outlook. Obviously, certainly, um, you know, plastics and rubbers to some extent have been uh, very badly hit, often near shutdown in the automotive industry uh, and already very low levels of factory and industrial manufacturing activity. We've also seen um, a number of the big global producers, the Dow Chemicals, the CP Chems, the BASFs, uh, they've already announced cuts to their 2020 budgets, and this will obviously result in any projects still being planned, now having to work uh, very hard really to justify any budget decisions, This certainly this half of the year, uh, and this could result in project schedules being uh, you know, reworked now to take stock of the new demand outlook growth rates. Um, you know, we, we expect and are seeing budgets being pushed out uh, later this year, uh, and also a number of projects now seeing their schedules and budget decisions being deferred until next year as well. Now, uh, like other sectors, projects already underway have seen some lower levels of productivity of reduced labor and contractor access. So this is going to continue, although we may see some easing. Um, but we, we're, one, one interesting development is we are seeing some improvement um, by the plant owners in their planning and announcement of those smaller implant capital projects. And those projects typically are in the sort of the five to 10 or you know, 10 to $20 million range. So this actually may be an upside to watch as we see some of that big capex move into small capex. Now, metals and minerals, um, obviously this covers the upstream mining as well as the downstream uh, processing and smelting sectors. Now, uh, the outlook really sort of flip-flopped for, for metals and minerals because we were actually expecting uh, some improvement this year. Uh, and that's because we've seen a number of years of retrenchment by the mining sector away from committing to major grassroots and expansionary type projects other than those which are deemed as really absolutely necessary to replace depleting ore grades and production rates. And what this resulted in was the, you know, the, the timing of new production capacity not really having kept pace with the expected demand growth long term. And so coming into the start of the year, there was an expectation that there may actually be some supply deficits 
uh, arising this year, or at least more rebalancing in supply and demand. And you know, copper was a, a good example of that. Um, and obviously, we've seen some 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 good tailwinds. We saw you know uh, the improvement in the economic outlook coupled with some good positive steps made with phase one of the. US tri, uh, China trade deal, and that could have added some up, uplift to overall manufacturing and with it some sort of uh, momentum behind metals demand. But clearly, this hasn't materialized. Uh, that's why we've uh, you know, rated this as, uh, as high impact at the moment. We are now seeing many metals such as steel and aluminium and indeed cement as well. Uh, we see these markets remain stubbornly oversupplied. Uh, and obviously, we've had the slump in manufacturing and factory activity, uh, you know, coupled with several, uh, you know, quarters of, of very mute manufacturing activity. And we expect this now to expect, extend into much, uh, you know, much of uh, Q2. Um, we've obviously seen much lower demand and, and slower activity from those key markets like automotive market and obviously the civil construction markets. And we expect the continuation of trade tariffs, um, you know, is all really keeping metals prices rather subdued this quarter. And, I, you know, we expect those prices to sort of stay fairly, you know, fairly flat into the remainder of the, the next quarter coming. So I think we may actually now be back to a situation of some very cautious spending, uh, and this will extend across not just mining, but also down into processing and smelting uh, parts of the supply chain as well. Uh, and so again, what we're going to see is a continued focus on implementing CapEx towards the implant capital projects, uh, those projects that focus on, uh, on adding more automation, process improvements, you know, swapping out old for new technologies and equipment. So pretty much business as usual there for metals. Now, uh, focusing just on power, uh, coming towards the end of our sectors, um, looking at the numbers, I think power related spending may actually be a little bit more resilient to the impact of COVID-19 and, and crude prices and hence we've rated it low for now. The rationale for this is that the long-term demand outlook for electricity provision remains very much intact uh, and certainly supportive of new capacity development. Now we are seeing some countries have uh, near double digit demand growth uh, and uh, although you know we've seen lower levels of industrial electricity demand off the shutdown but still nonetheless uh, there is you know, steep demand growth there and, and relatively low electricity penetration rates when we look at the sort of the total uh, APAC block. Now, we may see some impact on solar and wind projects in particular, certainly those projects which are uh, currently under construction, especially if they were relying on imported equipment and components coming from China. Uh, so there'll be bottlenecks there that will obviously be affecting project scheduling and uh, startup dates. Uh, as well as uh, just the natural, um, you know, theme of reduced productivity levels at project sites. So we are seeing some noticeable um, slippage to completion dates. Um, and obviously there may be some pressure on these renewables um, projects as well, coming from a wave of that competing cheap gas that's now available in the market. But uh, personally, I think <clears throat> a lot of that has already been factored into the market. Now, uh, just in closure for, for this final industry, I, I do think, um, you know, we are going to see some delays in budget decisions for those projects still at the planning stage. I just think it is, is, is just going to be a theme that runs across every industry at the moment where we will see a slowdown in budgeting decisions. Those FID decisions, I think, will be pushed out. Some of those bigger grassroots projects, I think, will come back to the back to the table. I think they'll be repriced or, or uh, certainly that the project schedules will be reworked. Uh, and so we are expecting to see delays to kickoff dates, mainly due, I think, to inaccessibility and restricted contractor mobility to get onto the projects in the first place, um, as opposed to any major shift in demand, which, as I said, remains very uh, strong and very healthy for the region. Now, um, that brings us to the conclusion of the discussion and, and, and apologies if we were not able to drill down deep enough into the specific markets or industries that you have a particular interest in. But as I referenced at the start of the session, our five-year spending forecast does actually uh, drill down 
uh, to the country level if necessary. And we also break out capital spending into the three main capex groups. And this can be then further broken down by individual sectors within each industry, as well as each fuel type within power generation. So it's a very useful tool and a good data set for supporting uh, folks with their mid to long term strategy and planning efforts. So if you need any deeper dives, then uh, please reach out to us. Uh, now, you know, going forward, uh, you know, we, we fully appreciate that we are all trying to navigate through what are obviously unprecedented times of uncertainty uh, and a lot more volatility. And many of you have, have, uh, have had to go back to the planning board really to review and update your strategies and strategies and plans for this year. So please do reach out to us to discuss how we can leverage and use the data that we have and, and, and the tools and outlook and forecast products that we have and, and see how we can support you. Um, and with that, I'd just like to say a very big thank you to our sponsors, the, the team over at Uniper. Thank you very much for your support today. Um, also, I would like you to uh, bring to your attention also, make sure that you make use of these webinars as well as running uh, with you know, additional regional spending forecasts like we've just done. We're going to be doing this one uh, every three weeks and the next one is going to be focusing on the European market. But we're also running with our regular schedule of deeper dive industry specific reviews. Uh, and the next one we have is for global uh, chemical processing and that's scheduled for next month on the 13th. So do please keep tuning in. Uh, and if you do miss any of them, then those who registered to attend can obviously get access to the recordings afterwards. So with that, I'd like to thank you for joining us and uh, bid you farewell and, and stay safe, everybody. <laughs>